A Glance in the Mirror Chapter 13 Suburban Living in the Thirties As can be imagined, death rates occurred higher in poor areas of the country. Harrow was considered the best place to receive medical treatment, and your chance of survival from treatment far greater. In 1930, the British Medical Association suggested a system of health insurance for practically all adults and their dependents, and this would include dentists, maternity and ophthalmology. It took another 15 years for the National Health Service to become fully operational after the Second World War. All towns were provided with public lavatories, some more elaborately built than others. North Harrow's was a brick-built and tiled-roofed building in an architectural style in keeping with all the local buildings. It was situated next to the service road bordering Cooper's Hardware Store and Maynard's Sweet Shop. It boasted a permanent staff of an aged couple who were most particular how their toilets were turned out. The brass work shone and the tiled floor sparkled. The Association of, for the Provision of Drinking Fountains and Horse Troughs had its beginnings in 1847, when the Liverpool local government bought out the private water companies. Their object was to construct public baths and stimulate interested parties to build drinking fountains. Twelve years later, Samuel Gurney, a London MP, started an association with the aim of building drinking fountains to provide pure cold water, the first to be built on Hoban Hill on the 21st of April 1859. With the collaboration of the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, drinking fountains for both humans and animals are claimed as necessary public amenities. Linking up with the evangelical movement gave the movement a strong link with the church. It became so popular that thousands of water troughs were installed on city and town streets. Henceforth, it became obligatory for local councils to provide space in all new town developments. North Harrow had two, one on Station Road and the other on Pinner Road, close to the town's main crossroads. By 1936, the association stopped building new troughs, as cars and trucks took over from the horse. However, more fountains were built at schools and parks. The metal cups chained to the bowls gave way to a small jet for the sake of hygiene. West Harrow Park, Headstone Park and Pinner Park all were provided with a fountain, the most elaborate, sited at West Harrow, the oldest park of the three. The standard 1929 design can be seen at each in addition to the more elaborate commutative fountains. The dust cart came round once a week on a Wednesday. The lorry was painted green and the collection was tipped into do domed compartments covered by a bowed sliding door. Anything which couldn't be placed in the back of the cart was put on the roof. Every house had its own metal bin and uh, complaints about having too much rubbish or throwing away an awkward shape or extra heavy item was never encountered. The dustman took everything away without question. The road sweeper pushed his metal slided, sided cart to his allotted station and there he took from the rack his broad headed broom to sweep the pavements pushing the rubbish into the gutters. When he had finished the pavements he swept the rubbish into neat piles in the gutters to be later shoveled up and placed in his cart and at the end of the day he pushed the cart to a collection place behind the shops where the council dust cart carried the waste to the dump. All the pavements and roads were similarly treated, and there was never any rubbish left lying about. Smoking was a universal habit enjoyed by at least half the population. The preponderance smoked cigarettes, middle-aged men smoked a pipe, and the wealthy had their cigars. There was no stigma attached to smoking. It became more regularised by both world wars as a social nicety, an introducer, and a companionable habit. In the forces, all ranks were issued with cigarettes, and they were used for betting, barter, and exchange. Restaurants, cinemas, cars, and public transport had 
cigarette holders and ashtrays built into their f- furniture. Visitors were presented with their own ashtray and dining tables set with cigarettes in special holders. The vast majority of children attended state secondary schools, working towards an in-school set, marked and invigilated exam. These children were, as far as I can remember, it was a a conveyor belt of things you had to do. You stepped on at 12 and alighted three years later. Children didn't display fear for the future or suffer sleep-disturbed nightmares. The future, leaving school for work, was another step on the path to adulthood. There was an abundance of jobs, and what one ended up doing was as much to do with your father's job as to the end of year's report. A number of boys quickly and quietly went from secondary schools to polytechnic, trade schools or technical college. They had worked out what they wanted to do. Others went to a prearranged apprenticeship. It wasn't a question of this job or that line or this was a better paid job. It was all up to fate and a little luck. There were and there was courting to think about and that was enough to worry about for the time being. The Labour Party adopted the principle of secondary education for all, irrespective of the income, class or occupation of their parents. That children may be transferred at the age of 11 plus from primary to one or the other of the secondary schools and remain there until 16. And this principle was a cornerstone of the Haddo Report in 1923 and came into being in 1926. The two types of secondary schools were uh, secondary modern schools and grammar. The children attending secondary modern schools were to leave at 15. The Haddo Report was accepted by the implementation delayed by the poor state of the country's economy. The majority of children by 1938 were operating within the reorganised secondary modern system. Some fee-paying schools from the private sector qualified for direct grants for taking on a number of scholarship boys. It's impossible to write about England's class structure without some reference to education. It's what is taught, how it's taught and why that defines for the recipient where they fit into the local structure. Children are carriers of the parents' assumed place in society. When educated, they carry also the school's aims and objectives, which include aspired places for their charges. This overlays their parents' opinions, lies in sympathy with it, or gives them their own place. It is highly likely that these opinions, shaped by heredity, environment and education, are confused, easily changed, and depend on circumstances. Class is a subject which will always have to be defined, and the answer will always include the school, place in year, class, what university, what course, who taught it, and with what result. As today's thinking suggests, education is a continuous, ongoing event, mostly what is aspired to. In 1929, William Morris of Oxford was dominating the car production industry. He alone, out of 58 companies, was way out in front, producing a series of models to take British car production ahead of France to become Europe's largest car producer. In 1937, Britain provided 15% of the world's vehicle exports, the record level of production. By 1938, Morris Motors included MG, Woolsey and Riley, and in 1939, Morris Motors produced 27% of the car market, the largest share by far. By 1924, Britain was producing 146,000 units, and 13 years later, the figure was over three times that number. The years in Britain's lowest production level, in the middle of the Depression, Britain produced more cars than in any previous year. By the end of our period, there were nearly 400,000 employed in motor manufacture. 
in 1935-36, a popular model could be bought for half the cost of one produced ten years before. The local motor vehicle industry was clo closely linked to aircraft production, motorcycling, push bikes, electrical engineering and kitchen equipment. The whole industry was 60% higher in 1937 than the figures for 1924. From the early 30s, rearmament boasted, boosted up production in electrical and mechanical engineering, particularly those industries closely linked to military vehicles and aircraft. The chemical industry developed many new materials from oil, plastic, rayon, synthetic dyes, fertilizers, animal food and gas. The industry employed 100,000 by 1939, catching up fast on engineering. And once again, rearmament served the chemical industry well, creating many new materials and uses. The greatest changes in society were led by the cinema. Lifestyles, values, language and music. Eight American filmmakers New World Influence. Their producers exerted pressure which, through a weekly injection, altered mainly working class morals, behaviour, speech and expectations. Many of Britain's best actors and comedians followed the trail to America when jobs were hard to find here. To stimulate British film production, the Cinematograph Films Act of 1927 was introduced, a wave of lavish productions by Alexander Corder through London Films tried to wrestle work away from America, and it failed miserably. A spate of cheap quickies also failed to satisfy quota requirements. Eventually the Act was modified in 1938, and again later evened out production schedules and quotas. Another film company in 1928, built upon the Neptune Film Company, became established as the ideal film company owned by Ludwig Blattner. The Blattner studio was leased to Joe Rock Productions, who bought the company, the whole eventually becoming British National Films Limited. Gainsborough's Gainsborough Film Company was also operating at the same time, producing comedy films with Will Hay. Associated British Cinemas, established in 1927, merged a number of Scottish cinema circuits, becoming British inter International Pictures, later absorbed into Elstree Studio Complex, Graham Wilcox Company. This merged with British National Studios and during the 1930s grew to become ABPC. The owner, John Maxwell, died in 1940. His widow sold out to Warner Brothers. In America, Warner Brothers developed the Vitaphone, sound on disc system, producing The Jazz Singer. And this was the start to Hollywood musicals. MGM won the first Oscar for the musical Broadway Melody in 1929, following the Wall Street crash. Busby Barclay reshaped the musical stage with his clever editing and unusual camera angles. The first animated musical was Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, quickly followed by MGM's The Wizard of Oz in 1939. The 30s was a period stage stars turned to the film studio for work, including Fred and Adele Astaire, Nelson Eddy and Jeanette MacDonald. It was in the 1930s that a series of British film comedies lifted the British cinema audiences. The works of Will Hay, Old Mother Riley, George Formby and Max Miller drew in the crowds. Rank's venture into filmmaking began when he was a Sunday school teacher. He punctuated his teaching with showing religious films to his own class and to other schools. Eventually, he made his own and, the distribu and distributed them. 
the Methodist Society complained that about the negative influence American films were having on young people. Rank took up the challenge to make his own family-friendly films. Within British National Film Company A.J. Rank created Pinewood Film Studios. He found, he, fa he found that after making Turn of the Tide he could get it screened. The American movie industry denied access. Rank solved the problem by buying a large part of both the distribution and exhibition systems, formed a partnership with C. M. Wolfe to create General Cinema Finance Corporation. He then used that company to buy out General Film Distributors, the UK arm of Universal Pictures. By 1937, Rank consolidated his filmmaking business in both Pinewood and Denham Film Studios and within a new company called the Rank Organisation. The following year he bought the Odeon Cinema chain and amalgamated studios in Elstree. The Rank Organisation then bought Gaumont British Pictures Corporation and Lime Grove Studios. The following year negotiated to buy Paramount cinema chain in 1942. By 1939 four million cinema seats gave daily access to the false, romantic, sham and colourful escapism of Hollywood. The first Technicolor film musical was The Wizard of Oz and from 1939 there was a string of fantastic musicals still produced on the stage today. The country's citizens were entertained by other popular mediums, the radio, football and boxing. These sops to the daily grind of life supplied relief, replacing religion which never recovered from the tragedy and farce of the First World War. Churchgoers fell from 20% to 12 between 1910 and 1960. From the start of the 30s, consumerism manifested considerable influence on the populace. There was more to buy, a more colourful society to copy, more money in the housewife's pockets and jobs were becoming available. Harrow, as we know it today, was a merger of Harrow on the Hill Urban District and Wheelstone and Hendon Rural Distri Districts in 1934. The town's chief claims to fame are its public school, church and hill, upon which both sit. Prior to the 1920s, its population gathered around the hill unevenly, spreading further out towards London. Every town in the vicinity has it, had its own cinema. Naturally, the largest town required the largest cinema, which more often than not was the smartest. Harrow had its Granada cinema which boasted an organ, the only cinema that had one nearby. In 1929 there were about 4,000 cinemas in Britain. The Granada was, when built, considered to be one of the new super cinemas that could seat up to 4,000 patrons. <laughs>